This video is the first in a series of videos in which I'm discussing how to diagnose diabetes. Now in the past, when I trained, it seemed as though this was simple. First, there were people who didn't have diabetes. Then there were people with type 1 diabetes who basically had an absolute deficiency of insulin. And then there were people with type 2 diabetes who both didn't make enough insulin as well as had resistance to insulin. And the world was simple. We treated those types of diabetes differently, and there wasn't a lot of confusion. Now I'm gonna add here that there's also pre-diabetes, which I'm not discussing, but there is both pre-type 2 diabetes and pre-type 1 diabetes. And ideally, we'd prevent people from developing overt diabetes if we diagnose them earlier. The American Diabetes Association Standards of Care classifies diabetes in this way. So first, they say type 1 diabetes is due to autoimmune beta cell destruction, usually leading to absolute insulin deficiency. And this includes latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, or LATA. So LATA is a form of type 1. Now, I think that there's a lot of subtlety here because there are people with type 1 who don't have measurable autoantibodies. There are people with LATA who are treated a lot like they have type 2 diabetes, at least for a while. And we know from the Jocelyn 50-year follow-up study that people with type 1 diabetes after 50 or more years may still make a little bit of measurable C-peptide. In theory, type 1 diabetes is autoimmune beta cell destruction that leads to insulin deficiency. Type 2 diabetes is due to a non-autoimmune progressive loss of adequate beta cell insulin secretion, and this is frequently on the background of insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome. I'm going to point out that the metabolic syndrome can occur in anybody, and I have a lot of patients with type 1 diabetes who also have the metabolic syndrome. So I think that's a separate issue for many of our patients, but very important because it confers a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Then there are all of these subtypes of diabetes due to other causes, and frankly, these are the patients that I most often see. There are patients who have monogenic diabetes syndromes, such as neonatal diabetes and maturity onset diabetes of the young, or MODI. Diseases of the exocrine pancreas, such as cystic fibrosis and pancreatitis, patients who are post-pancreatectomy, patients who have drug or chemically induced diabetes, such as with glucocorticoid use, people who are treated for HIV AIDS, and those who have organ transplantation. And fourth, there is gestational diabetes, which is diabetes diagnosed in the second or third trimester of pregnancy that was not present prior to the pregnancy and tends to go away after the pregnancy but confers an increased risk for type 2 diabetes in the future. Almost everything we do depends on the clinical status of the patient and how they respond to treatment, not necessarily just based on a label. There is no one specific test that separates people with type 1 diabetes from type 2 diabetes. Islet autoantibodies can be present in every type of diabetes, from type 1 diabetes to type 2 diabetes to MODI. And there are people with type 1 diabetes who don't have measurable insulin autoantibodies. We know that DKA, although we think of it occurring in people with type 1 diabetes, can occur in people with type 2 diabetes. C-peptide levels can be high or normal in people with type 1 diabetes at the onset of their diagnosis, although a very low C-peptide level generally determines that someone does have type 1 diabetes. And then I have patients who are post-pancreatectomy who have a very low C-peptide level, less than 0.6, although they are not actually considered as having type 1 diabetes because it's not autoimmune, even though that's how they behave clinically. And finally, in people who have MODI, which you might think is the simplest form of diabetes because it's a monogenic gene defect, you can see different phenotypic expressions in terms of their glucose levels. So for example, I have a family 
where three sisters have exactly the same genes, but the oldest has normal glucose tolerance, the middle sister has impaired glucose tolerance, and the youngest sister has diabetes and is on treatment with a sulfonylurea agent. So even the same genes can be expressed differently. So to help you deal with all of this confusion, I am providing three additional videos that will try to help you understand how I assess the types of diabetes and how to treat people clinically. The most important lesson that I tell my patients every day is that your body will tell us what it needs because I often can't predict the course of an individual's diabetes. I can't tell them if and when they'll end up on insulin, but what I can do is follow people and treat them based on what they need at that moment in time. Thank you.